introduce our two speakers for the day for what has become our annual Supreme Court preview. First with us today is Thomas Dupree, Jr. Mr. Dupree is a co-partner in charge of the Gibson uh, PC office, and he also co-chairs the firm's national appellate and constitutional law practice group. He is a very experienced trial and appellate advocate, having argued over 100 federal appeals, including in all 13 circuits and in front of the United States Supreme Court. Before joining his current firm, he served in the Department of Justice, where he was appointed to be the Deputy Assistant Attorney General for the Civil Division, and later went on to become the Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General for the Civil Division. And in that capacity, he oversaw over 900 attorneys. He completed his undergraduate degree at Williams College and later went on to our very own University of Chicago Law School. Um, during that time, he was the editor for the Law Review and then he graduated with honors. After law school, he also went on to clerk for the Honorable Jerry Smith of the Fifth Circuit. Our second speaker that we have with us today is Misha Salen. He leads Troutman Pepper's National Appellate and Supreme Court Practice Group currently. He has argued and prevailed in front of the Supreme Court in significant redistricting cases, as well as high stakes regulatory takings cases. Before joining the current firm, he served as the Solicitor General of Wisconsin, and also served in the office of the West Virginia Attorney General as the Deputy Attorney General and as General Counsel. He completed his undergraduate degree at Amherst College and later went on to Georgetown University Law Center. After law school, he clerked for Judge Kaczynski of the Ninth Circuit, Judge Brown of the D.C. Circuit, and finally for Justice Kennedy of the Supreme Court of the United States. Please join me in welcoming our speakers today. That was very impressive without a note. That's, that's, that as bodes well for a future appellate advocate there. I think the only part of my resume that you didn't mention in my times I graduated from law school from Gibson's College was that I did for a couple years work for Tom um, at Gibson Dunn uh, we, we, Tom hired me three separate times uh, at Gibson, and speaking of three, this is our third year now doing this this uh, Supreme Court preview. Absolutely. And yes, thank you, Ali, for that wonderful introduction. And I, I guess as long as we're filling in biographic lines, I don't have this on my public resume, but when I was at the law school, I was the vice president of events for the Federal Society, which was hugely important, as I suspect it still is today, because it was responsible for arranging for the, the pizza and the drinks and all of that. So I'm glad to see these excellent traditions being carried on. Uh, so, so thank you again for having us. Uh, Misha and I are just absolutely delighted to be here. It's always kind of exciting in the fall when the first Monday in October rolls around and kind of it's, I don't know, you know, for me at least, it's, it's, it's a feeling not too similar to like, you know, Christmas morning you wake up and you kind of see all the gifts and you look at the term and you see all the amazing cases uh, that the court is set to decide. And they're still adding to it. Uh, they've already populated, you know, a fairly significant portion of the docket, but, you know, we will continue to see cases added to the to the, uh, to the docket as, you know, the months move on. Um, so far, I would say that the, the term is shaping up is perhaps not as momentous as last term. Um, again, we'll see, of course, what cases get added. Um, but they certainly have a, a focus this term on administrative law and regulatory law. There are a number, some of which we'll be discussing today, but a number of very high profile regulatory cases on the Supreme Court's docket, which is typical and somewhat reflective of the way the court uh, you know, has, has you know, acted in the last few years, that there are certain topical areas of law that they seem to be focused on. Maybe they sense kind of you know, the need to bring a little more rigor to the analysis and, and areas where they, they definitely are looking to be more active uh, than courts in terms pass. And I think administrative law is certainly uh, up at the top of the list. Um, this is, of course, you know, kind of where we're now in the, an era where we have there's a solid six to three conservative majority on the court, and by by most accounts, I would say it's it's the court has been performing kind of as many people expected, um, and I say that not just with regard to the outcome of particular cases, you know, overruling Roe versus Wade, and you know, important precedents in the area of affirmative action, Second Amendment rights. Um, but also in terms of the cases that reach the court's docket. I think one thing that often kind of gets lost in particularly media coverage of the Supreme Court is that the changed composition of the court not only has an effect on the outcomes of the cases, but on what cases the court chooses to decide. Um, I mean, it's no secret, and Supreme Court justices have talked about this, is that a big consideration in deciding whether to vote to grant cert in a case is how the court thinks that's gonna come out. And so you could have cases where justices would say, this is an important issue, we probably do need to clarify this area of law, but 
given the current composition of the court, now is not the right time to take on this issue. And when you have pretty much total 100% control of the cases that you decide, that make it on your docket, you know, unlike most appellate courts in the United States, the Supreme Court, of course, is a court of discretionary review, they can choose what areas of law they want to decide uh, and, and decide in. And so I think for that reason, too, the kind of changed composition of the court um, is having and will continue to have fairly far-reaching consequences. Um, the last thing I'll say, just by way of kind of introduction, is that notwithstanding the solid 6 to 3 conservative majority, one interesting dynamic we've observed, particularly in the last term, is that the conservatives don't always vote as a block. Uh, there are several cases where, you know, the kind of quote-unquote conservative justices voted for kind of quote-unquote the liberal outcome, the Voting Rights Act, uh, and other areas where it would be a mistake to just assume that all six conservative justices are going to see these same legal issues the same way. Um, and so I think advocates going before the court, particularly in politically charged or constitutional cases, now need to think about, well, okay, I'm not just appealing to kind of, you know, the, the Justice Thomases and the Alitos, but I want to make sure that I also convince, you know, the Robertses, the Kavanaugh's, and the Gorsuch's of the world. Um, one just fascinating <coughs> statistic from last term was that Justice Kavanaugh was more often in alignment with Justice Jackson than with Justice Thomas um, in cases, which again is one of those kind of, can that possibly be right? Um, but it just goes to show that it would be a mistake to treat those six conservative votes as monolithic uh, and not subject to persuasion in an appropriate case. Yeah, so, you know, Justice Brennan used to ask his law clerks when they first started, you know, what's the most important rule of the U.S. Supreme Court? And, you know, the clerks say, oh, the First Amendment, the Fourteenth Amendment. And they say, no, it's the rule of five. You need to get five votes to win at the court. And so, it is a, a big difference between having a 5-4 conservative court and a 6-3 conservative court. When you have a 5-4 conservative court, you know, then you, then you as an advocate, who want, if you want to reach a result the conservatives wouldn't like, or if you're a conservative advocate and you want to make sure you don't lose the vote, you got to think about, you know, what's, I can't, you can't lose one justice, because the, the, liberal, the liberal justices are voting as a block. And there, if you have a, a justice who's on the conservative side that has like an esoteric view of the law, like Justice Thomas does sometimes, like Justice Scalia used to, you could win it by just picking off one vote. But now, and it doesn't really work. I mean, there was a, an important Clean Water Act case last term when where the, the environmentalists managed to get Justice Kavanaugh on their side. One of the cases that he was with Justice Jackson, but they still lost five to four because you got to get you got to get six votes. It's the same. You know, in, in, in Dobbs, the, the case of returning Roe Ro versus Wade, you know, the chief is definitely an incrementalist. So, um, the, depending on how you look at who is trying to, you know, the 15-week ban um, being upheld, whether that was, who's, who was winning there, um, the, the fact that the chief was willing to uphold the 15-week ban but wasn't willing to go further didn't end up making a substantive difference because there was the rule of five. Five votes to overturn Roe Ro versus Wade. So in order to get a, a, a liberal result or to avoid a liberal result, uh, depending on how you're looking at it, now you've got to look at you know, what's the kind of position that would convince a block of conservatives. And the most likely block of conservatives that is likely to move with the liberal justices are Chief Kavanaugh and sometimes Barrett. But I think most, most likely the Chief and, and Kavanaugh. So you've got to craft your arguments in a way, if you're trying to get those votes, to, um, to appeal to, the, to that block and find commonality between them, which is quite different than how you would do it if you were trying to get one esoteric vote. It doesn't get you much good if you can come up with a theory that gets you just Justice Thomas, uh, because he has some esoteric view of uh, the ar you know, arbitration or things of, of that sort, if you've got to get two votes. So that is an interesting dynamic that advocates are certainly paying attention to, and court watchers are certainly pay, paying attention to. Yeah, and, and actually that reminds me of a, a story involving your, your former boss, Justice Kennedy. When he was on the court, as you all probably know, he was, he was the swing justice in a lot of these cases. You know, one justice, which way would Kennedy go would determine <coughs> the outcome of the case. And so in some cases where advocates knew that Justice Kennedy's vote was going to be crucial to assembling that five justice majority, you would literally have people, typically amici, but they would file amicus briefs that would only cite Kennedy opinions. So that whether that be like majority, <laughs> concurrences, dissents, it would be like the law according to Justice Kennedy. I mean, it was cynical, it was transparent, I loved it, because it just showed, it underscored the importance of getting that vote. 
Uh, I don't recommend writing, you know, votes or briefs, you know, tailored to the vote of a single justice. But again, people kind of were, were happy to be very honest about it, realizing that that was the one vote in play, that was the one vote that was going to decide it, and that's why you basically see the brief that would say it exclusively to Kennedy opinions. <laughs> so. Right. Anyways, um, before we talk about the cases, one thing we did just want to touch on is, is just address the, the, the issue that kind of at least has been dominating the media in the last few months about Supreme Court ethics. Um, you know, as, as you all probably know, there are a number of bills right now pending in Congress um, that would effectively force the United States Supreme Court to adopt its own ethics code and then apply it to itself. Um, they had a hearing. I was called to testify as one of the kind of the, the you know Republican witnesses um, before the Senate Judiciary Committee a few months ago, where they discussed the wisdom of the bill and kind of you know at least my opinion is that it was just blatantly unconstitutional. Um, that in my view, what Congress was trying to do was effectively impose its own will on a co-equal coordinate branch of our government. Um, that if the United States Supreme Court wants on its own to adopt an ethics code, uh, you know, to you know, boost public confidence, more power to it, and it can and should do so if it chooses to do so. But what Congress is currently contemplating doing is passing a law that would require the Supreme Court to act just like a federal agency and put out a public code of ethics for notice and comment, I kid you not, get comments from the public, and then once that notice and comment process was completed, adopt the code for itself. Um, so, you know, at least in, in my, you know, kind of, you know, humble opinion, um, that was just a, a complete power grab by Congress, totally unconstitutional. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure my testimony persuaded them. I can't imagine for, you know, a minute that they would do something, you know, kind of so unconstitutional like that. Surely, surely Congress would respect the prerogative of the Supreme Court to govern its own affairs. So I'm, I'm optimistic it will go away. But this whole issue of ethics in the Supreme Court, I'm confident, is going to stay with us for a while, at least unless and until the court does something on its own, such as adopt the code for itself. Yeah, no, look, I mean, I have an even more cynical view of what's going on there. There's no, no one actually... No one actually <laughs> Hard to beat me on that front. No, no, no one actually <laughs> believes this thing is going to pass. And so what the push for, for this legislation coming from the quarters that is coming, along with the, the articles, the deep dive reports on, you know, law clerks contributing to Christmas parties and, and things of that sort that you see in the press. You know, this is part of a certain aspect of the political um, spectrum that is very unhappy that they lost control of the U.S. Supreme Court. They're, uh, they're unhappy that they're going to um, get decisions that they don't like uh, in, in certain hop-out areas for a while. And they have this push to, to try to pack the court. And so what they're doing with this, with this focus on ethics is to try to come up with another story to convince more people that may be on the moderate Democrat side to jump on board the, the pack the court bandwagon. And this kind of renewed focus in these ProPublica articles and these you know, investigations into things that you know, all the justices from left, uh, from left to right have been doing, going on these junkets and things of that sort, you know, going, teaching one class over the summer and then staying there for a while. So I think everyone knew what was going on. Uh, is now just an effort to try to delegitimize the court with the ultimate goal to try to get a, a sufficient political coalition to pack the court. And if not to pack the court, to at least intimidate the Supreme Court from doing um, what the majority of the court thinks is, the, is, the, is right under the original public meaning of the U.S. Constitution. That's what I really think is going on. No, I, I, I agree with most of that. I mean, most, if not all of that. I mean, the, 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 from my perspective, I think it is fair to say that <coughs> a substantial majority, or at least a substantial percentage, of the people who have just kind of jumped on this ethics bandwagon in the last few years are people who are just unhappy with the recent trend in the court. They don't like conservative decisions. They don't like the outcomes of particular cases, and that they see this just as a way kind of to delegitimize the institution um, rather than actually reform it. Yeah, zero of those people w would have cared about Justice Ginsburg um, taking, you know, well-funded trips by, you know, left-wing donors. Zero. Literally not a single one of those folks. So, you know, it's, it's a bit of a civil capital. Okay, well, let's talk about some of the cases. Uh, you want to start us off? <laughs> <laughs> you want to start us off and, and talk about some of the uh, ad law cases? Or? Yeah, so the first case I'll talk about is, is a, a case dealing with the, the, the constitutionality of the funding structure of the CFPB. And the CFPB is the brainchild of, of Elizabeth Warren. It was created to, uh, to essentially be a consumer protection agencies um, with regard to the financial industry. And 
what Elizabeth Warren, who was then a professor and now, you know, then went into the Obama administration, later became a senator, was concerned about is she thought that the only way you would really have the kind of um, robust regulation that she thought was necessary w was to, would be to insulate the CFPB from all political accountability so that you know, enlightened bureaucrats could really do the things that Elizabeth Warren believed they should be doing. So the way that, that she structured and then ultimately Congress structured the CFPB was one, to be isolated, insulated from presidential accountability by making the director only removable for good cause by the president, essentially making the director immune from political accountability. The US Supreme Court struck that uh, aspect of of the CFPB down uh, 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 two, I think two or three terms ago. But the second aspect of what uh, Congress tried to do to insulate the CFPB with political accountability was to take the CFPB outside of the traditional <coughs> appropriations structure. And those of you who you know, know about the appropriations clause, basically it says that you can't, you know, any money that's gonna be spent has to be appropriated by Congress. So th this acts as an important check to keep the executive branch and this kind of shadow executive branch, the administrative branch, that's since developed accountable to Congress. So not only, so obviously Congress passes laws, but sometimes these agencies go off and do their own thing. Uh, and we'll talk about the manner in which they, they do it uh, and when Tom talks about the, the Chevron case immediately after. But, but besides the judicial check, which has been somewhat neutered by the Chevron doctrine, there is supposed to be a, an appropriations check. That is to say, if an agency doesn't do, or the president or one of his sub-cabinet folks doesn't do what, what Congress meant for them to do, they just won't get the funding. They can't, spend, they can't um, do the stuff because they won't have money to pay their own salaries through anything else. And so this at least, as our founder saw it, was one way to keep um, uh, the executive branch accountable to Congress. So, but in, in um, the Dodd-Frank Act creating the CFPB, what Congress did was they said the CFPB could essentially set its own budget and get the money from the Federal Reserve, um, which itself isn't subject to appropriations. So essentially by, and then also uh, the CFPB isn't accountable to even going to congressional appropriations committees and explaining what it's doing under another unprecedented provision uh, of, of, of the Dodd-Frank Act. So what happened is the Fifth, the Fifth Circuit struck down this funding regime as unconstitutional, as violating the Appropriations Clause, and further held that that means that anything the CFPB does with that unconstitutional money derived from the Federal Reserve, not appropriated in the traditional sense, is unconstitutional. Now the, the, the Fifth Circuit's decision on this point is a bit of an outlier with regard to other circuits that have, that have looked at the CFPB, and the reason it's a bit of an outlier is the U.S. Supreme Court has never actually struck down any sort of funding structure as violating the Appropriations Clause. Depending on how you look at it, there have been some other structures in our nation's history that are not kind of traditional appropriations, you know, you know, um, agencies funding themselves through fees and things of that sort. And so while the CFPB is certainly <coughs> historically unprecedented, um, in order for the courts to really strike it down, you gotta come up with a theory and an approach that cabins the the, the invalidation in a way that wouldn't have invalidated things that were happening since the beginning of the founding, wouldn't invalid, invalidate a bunch of other stuff. So the case was heard last week at the US Supreme Court, and I think it's fair to say that the challengers to the CFPB did not have a good day in court. There was a lot of skeptical questions from justices all over the political spectrum about you know, what, the, what the real limiting principle was of the challenge to the CFPB's funding structure, you know, Famously, you know, was it Je uh, Justice Jackson or someone? Oh, Justice Powell said that pornography is what it is. I don't know what when I see it, or is, you know, obscenities. I still know when I see it. That's obviously not a, not a way to do a, a separation of powers doctrine. And I think that the Noel Francisco, the advocate for um, the CFSA, who was challenging the CFPB, ran into a lot of headwinds as to what exactly this theory was. You know, if you worded in an intellectually kind of cohesive manner, it tends to take out too much historically. And if you if you word it in a kind of a bespoke manner, it starts to look like a, a ticket for 
uh, for one ride only, which is also unsatisfactory. There also wasn't a lot of questions that, um, that either side got on the issue of what the appropriate remedy was, if there wasn't a finding of an unconstitutional um, funding structure, which is obviously a bad sign for the challengers. You know, I had written an amicus brief uh, in this case against the CPB on, the, on behalf of the third party payment processors association who had a big problem with some of the rules the CFPB has put out. We were obviously disappointed by um, what we heard at oral argument. Um, and so if, in fact, the CFPB's funding structure is going to survive and the CFPB is going to be able to act without meaningful accountability to Congress, it's going to be very important um, for the courts to then check the substantive work of the CFPB to make sure that it actually complies with what Congress set out. And we did write an amicus brief um, for the for the same organization, ta explaining talking about the same problematic CFPB rules in the Loper case dealing with Chevron deference, which is our next topic. Oh, that was a perfect lead, Nisha. Thank you. So, uh, the, the the case I want to start off with is my absolute favorite, at least for now, on the docket this term. This is the Loper Bright case, which could become you know well known in future years as the Loper Bright doctrine, just as the Chevron doctrine um, has become ingrained in our collective legal understanding and memory. So. For those of you who haven't had administrative law, Chevron, of course, is the famous case in the Supreme Court that says, unless Congress speaks directly to an issue in the statute, if it leaves ambiguity, if it leaves questions open, courts must defer to the federal agency's reasonable interpretation of that statute. In kind of layman's terms, it's basically a tie goes to the agency rule that commands judicial deference to agency interpretations. Chevron was popular when it came out. Uh, it was kind of in the, the glory of the Reagan era, and everyone was animated by a deregulatory spirit. And so in that sense, people thought that Chevron was actually a conservative decision because it would enable you know, the then Reagan administration to allow its agencies to go out, roll back regulations, and command courts to defer to what the Reagan administration agencies were saying. Well, times changed, and I think over the course of the ensuing decades, People had a lot of questions, not just about the kind of you know policy political wisdom about the Chevron doctrine, but really going back to first principles. Um, then Judge Neil Gorsuch, when he was a Tenth Circuit judge, wrote a concurring opinion. I believe actually it was a concurrence to his own majority opinion, but he wrote a concurring opinion where he questioned Chevron. He said, if we go back to Marbury versus Madison and first principles of our government, it is emphatically the province of the judicial department to say what the law is. And if that's the fundamental premise underlying our entire judicial brands, well, then how the heck can you justify a doctrine that says, well, it's actually the prerogative of the regulatory agency to say what the law is, unless it just is really unreasonable or Congress has already answered it. That you just can't reconcile Chevron with the concept that it's the prerogative of our federal judges to interpret federal law. So when just Judge Gorsuch wrote that, I mean, honestly, it kind of like you know sent a shockwave through the otherwise sleepy administrative law bar because this is a concept that people had you know whispered about you know in, in you know kind of law review offices and saying could this be you know is Chevron really justified? But you couldn't question Chevron. So when someone as respectable and authoritative as Judge Gorsuch questioned it, I think it really opened the door to a lot of people. Certainly, a lot of academic interest, a lot of interest in practitioners. I mean, I can't count the number of cert petitions in the years since that said the court may wish to grant so it can overrule Chevron. And of course, you know, every year the court would they would often grant administrative law cases that presented the Chevron question. And so those of us who toil in the vineyards of administrative law would think, is this the case? Is this the one they're going to take that will overrule Chevron? And every year it was like Charlie Brown and Lucy in the football, where like you know the Supreme Court would pull it away at the last last minute and Chevron would survive for another day. Without being mentioned. So yes, yes. It just it, it just had this life. It just could as the horror movie villain you could not kill. It would always come back. So anyway, so as I, famous last words. Loper Bright is the case that will overrule Chevron. We will see. Uh, Loper Bright is on this court's docket. The court has yet to schedule an argument date, but the question is squarely presented, and presumably this is why the court granted cert should Chevron be overruled. And the facts of Loper Bright are fantastic. I mean, honestly, kind of like a free market libertarian conservative, I couldn't have scripted a better idea. This concerns a federal regulation that governs herring fishermen. And apparently, if you are a herring fisherman, at least under certain circumstances, you have to have a federal monitor embedded in your boat, I presume, to enforce the limits on, on herring fishing. And, I mean, I am not a herring fisherman, but I am reliably advised that the cost 
of this monitor, which the regulation says the herring fisherman must pay for. So not only do you need to let you know the federal guy on your boat, you got to pay his salary. If you were a herring fisherman, that can consume like 20% of your wages. I mean, my heart went out to herring fishermen around the world when I saw this. <laughs> anyway, so justice is on their side. But the question is whether the Supreme Court is actually going to overrule Chevron. Um, I, you know, famous last words. I, I think they very well could be poised to do it. And if not, just you know, kind of formally overrule it, at least construe it or limit it so substantially that it, it, it is not what we have commonly understood as the Chevron doctrine. They have basically redefined it out of existence. One very interesting thing to notice, and, and, and you've probably seen this, kind of those of us who like monitor what the Solicitor General says in, in briefs before the court, is that over the last five or 10 years, the Solicitor General, who if anyone would be poised to claim Chevron deference in the Supreme Court, it would be the Solicitor General, has all but abandoned invoking Chevron deference. They haven't completely done it. But there have been many, many cases that, you know, if you were a government lawyer, would almost cry out for urging the court to apply Chevron deference. And the Solicitor General, I think, realizing that Chevron is kind of, you know, existing under the sword of Damocles, has not made the Chevron argument. So I think there, too, the Solicitor General almost implicitly has realized that the writing may be on the wall for Chevron. Um, so if, in fact, they do go ahead and overrule it, um, you know, I think fair to say it would be somewhat of a sea change in administrative law, although, as I noted, Chevron has been decreasingly applied over the years, so it doesn't play as much a role in administrative litigation as it has historically. But I think it nonetheless would send a very, very strong signal, strong as possible signal, to the lower courts that when it comes to interpreting statutes, you don't defer to the agency. Judges have their jobs because they're smart people, they're capable of reading statutes, and they're capable of determining what the law is. Yeah, so I mean, the, I think it's true that, well, first of all, Chevron hasn't actually been applied by the U.S. Supreme Court in like 15 years. And I think in conservative circuits, you know, they're kind of following that that view. But, you know, if, you, when you're, if you're doing ad law case in the D.C. Circuit, um, you know, Chevron is still the 8,000-pound the gorilla. Uh, and then just, you know, a little aside about Justice Gorsuch and, and Chevron deference. The way the U.S. Supreme Court cases get named is they're named after the party that petitions for cert. So, so she Chevron was Chevron versus NRDC. Um, now, now, the actual underlying case in Chevron was actually brought by the NRDC against the EPA. Uh, and if the EPA had petitioned for cert and it had done so under its administrator's name, at the time uh, EPA of Chevron, the, um, at least right before the cert petition, the administrator was uh, the mother of Neil Gorsuch. Uh, uh, and so if, if the EPA rather than Chevron had petitioned for cert in Chevron, it would be known as Gorsuch deference. <laughs> <laughs> and so jo Justice Gorsuch would be, uh, would, would have had the, this the amazing honor of killing off the doctrine named after his mom. But the, 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 sadly or happily, whatever, that, is, the, that, is not, that did not occur. Um, <laughs> So um, the next case, completely from a different area of law, you know, uh, comes from the area of redistricting. And Tom, during his opening remarks, said one of the things the Supreme Court can do is control its own docket and, des uh, and decide and decide that it's not going to take a certain area. But in a certain category of cases, coming up through uh, from three judge panels, the Supreme Court has essentially mandatory appellate jurisdiction. Now they can some ways to get around it by saying the issue is just so unimportant that, or so unsubstantial we're not going to take it. But in certain three-judge panel cases, the U.S. Supreme Court is the direct appeal. If it's a substantial issue, the Supreme Court does have to take it. And that's why the U.S. Supreme Court continues to get more election uh, and more particular, more redistricting cases than I think it, it, it otherwise would want. And what the U.S. Supreme Court currently has on its, on its docket, and it's going to be argued, I believe, later this week or next week, is this case where um, there was a challenge to uh, a, a congressional district that was drawn in South Carolina as a racial gerrymander. Now, what, you know, in order to really understand this, I know, and I'll be calling so talented, I've got to get, give you guys a little, little primer on, on redistricting law. So, um, under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, um, Congre a, a state has to draw a majority-minority district in certain, in certain circumstances, which means it's got to be race focused. But two, um, the Supreme Court has held that political gerrymandering is not unconstitutional, or at least not justiciable under the U.S. Constitution. Three, the U.S. Supreme Court has held that uh, when a state 
draws uh, districts with the predominant purpose of race, that is unconstitutional until unless the state can satisfy strict scrutiny um, under the under doctrine known as the Shaw Doctrine. So with regard to the Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, um, you got to draw districts based on race in certain circumstances. But under the Shaw Doctrine, you can't draw districts based on race unless you can satisfy strict scrutiny, which the Supreme Court has said, at least in various considered dicta, includes compliance of sec with Section 2 of the VRA. So last term in the Alabama case, that case raised the, the real tension between these two things. Because Alabama drawing race blind districts would never draw would never have drawn a second majority minority district. But under traditional understandings of what Section Two of the VRA doctrine requires, Alabama had to. And the Supreme Court ruled against Alabama in a somewhat surprise decision last term, based largely on deference to the to the to the district courts, factual findings on Section Two of the VRA, and then uh, you might have seen the news, the U.S. Supreme Court recently rebuffed Alabama's attempt to try to step around that ruling, um, you know, essentially sticking to its its decision in, in the Alabama Section 2 of the VRA case. But that case ultimately turned, I think, on deference to the district, to, to the trial court, you know, which is not something that you, the U.S. Supreme Court usually gets involved in because if it's an issue of applying an established body of law, the Supreme Court will deny cert. But in election law cases, coming up through these three judge panels, the Supreme Court has no choice. Now, this, how does this relate to the South Carolina case? Well, in the South Carolina case, a three judge panel, the defense there by the, by the South Carolina legislature was we were not doing racial gerrymandering, we were just doing politics, which the US Supreme Court has said is permissible. And race and politics are strongly correlated in certain parts of the country. And they said, of course, why would we be doing this race stuff? We obviously wanted to have more Republicans in Congress. It's kind of silly to say that we were doing racial gerrymandering. We were doing political gerrymandering. And the district court, three-judge panel, and I think a pretty questionable factual decision, said no, the, the, the South Carolina legislature, even though explicitly was seeking for political advantage, even though its motivation would appear to be most obviously political advantage was actually doing racial gerrymandering. And as I said, I think as a initial matter, if you look at the evidence, it's pretty clear that's not what happened. But the US Supreme Court is now taking this case essentially as a traditional appellate court. And while South Carolina attempts to put some legal issues in there, it's ultimately an issue of is the US Supreme Court going to second guess uh, what the three judge panel has done? And I think that there is a good reason to think the Supreme Court might be open to doing that, notwithstanding with what happened in Alabama. The problem is, of course, if the, the doctrines are such that the legislature can't do race stuff unless it has to do race stuff. And it can do politics, but it can't do race. And if that's ultimately decided by whatever three-judge panel is drawn, legislatures are in an impossible position because then it's just a matter of the luck of the draw, what three-judge panel you, um, you get, and you can never be assured that your map is gonna survive, no matter how good legal advice uh, you get in advance. So if the US Supreme Court is not gonna take a more muscular view, review of these, of these three-judge panels, and just, let, just give them deference, and this can go left and right. You know, conservatives can come up with a, can come up, come up with a, a successfully composed panel that can get them factual findings in, in determining that, that what Democrats have sought to do as a permissible under federal law political gerrymander is actually a, um, a, a racial gerrymander and thus, thus unconstitutional. You basically have redistricting by three judge panel lottery. And the US Supreme Court, I think, will be tempted in the South Carolina case to go a little, uh, to be a little more searching than it was in the Alabama case because there isn't any issue of Section 2 of the VRA here. It's just clearly what happened here is the Alabama, is the, is the South Carolina Supreme Court was trying to engage in some political gerrymandering. And to put a little bit of a, a little bit of teeth on the Supreme Court's review of these three judge panels so that they're not just essentially making redistricting maps throughout um, their jurisdictions. I can't imagine the Supreme Court actively enjoys getting involved in all of these redistricting jurisdictions. I mean, kind of the vibe that you get from a lot of their decisions are kind of they want to, you know, limit their involvement, you know, particularly if it is perceived as kind of, you know, getting involved in the, the you know, ground level political process. 
Um, you know, things are not justiciable, they don't want to get into it, but in some cases, to your point, they don't have a choice. Yeah, they certainly tried to get rid of, get out of the thicket through, um, in the political gerrymandering case, and what, you know, the folks on the other side of those cases said, is they said, court, you know, these cases are just going to come back as political, as racial gerrymandering cases, and as Section 2 cases. And while the Supreme Court was correct in Uchu and deciding as it did, the, the plaintiffs in that case, their predictions <coughs> have, have borne out of the real world. Yeah. Well, one of the fun things about watching the Supreme Court over the years is seeing the court grapple with establishing existing bodies of case law, you know, existing doctrines, particularly in the constitutional context, to new technologies. Uh, and one area where this has particularly been, you know, visible the last few years is in the context of, you know, social media and new technologies. Um, and so this term, the court has already granted a number of cases um, in this area. Uh, there, there were two cases that kind of came up as a tandem um, that the court just added to its docket recently. Um, they both involve efforts by state legislatures, one from Texas, one from Florida, to essentially regulate uh, how social media platforms can run their sites. Um, and although the law's particulars differ a little bit, kind of Texas and Florida both were getting at the same sort of thing, where both the states were concerned that social media platforms, including you know Facebook, including you know Twitter, now known as X, other platforms um, were, were stifling political speech. Um, you know, typically it would be conservative speech that they would be stifling. Uh, they would, you know, be striking things, banning it, taking it down from the site, often without explanation. And so the legislatures each passed a law that essentially sought to control what the social media companies can do. Um, and this would range from either just, you know, A, flatly prohibiting, um, you know, banning certain types of speech or not posting it on the site. Um, it also involved in cases where the company decided to take down a post, providing kind of a reasoned explanation uh, for, for why they did that. Um, the, the social media companies um, lost uh, in, the, in, the, in the challenges that came out of the, the challenge that came out of the Fifth Circuit. They won in the challenge that came out of the Eleventh Circuit, the Florida's law. So as these cases came up to the court, um, you really had a classic instance of a, a demonstrable circuit split, notwithstanding the particular differences in the two laws, but on a very important, timely recurring issue. And in fact, one of the, the kind of funny things out looking at it is, by my account or by my estimation, I think every party involved told the court that it needed to grant cert, mm -hmm. um, you know, which is somewhat rare. I mean, typically when a case goes up to the court, you have one party, you know, banging the table that this is the most important, urgent case that demands this court's resolution, and the other says, uh, nothing to see here, court, you know, move <laughs> on. But, but this was one where all the parties were aligned in the importance of review. Um, the Supreme Court granted it. They confined their review to two questions as the Solicitor General had framed them um, in her brief. She said, here are the two questions you should decide, and the Supreme Court you know, helpfully from the SG's perspective said, we accept the Solicitor General's suggestion we grant review on these, these two questions. Um, at the heart of these cases is really the fundamental question whether what the social media companies, the tech companies are doing constitutes protected expression. Um, in the view of the legislatures, um, th these companies aren't really engaging in expression themselves. I mean, they're providing, you know, a forum, a marketplace for, for public speech to occur. And seen through that prism, in the view of the legislatures, it's perfectly permissible to regulate these companies and say, you know, you, you can't, you know, discriminate among types of speech. You can't ban this speech and allow this speech. If you do want to prohibit something from being said on your site, you have to basically provide due process of sort. You have to provide a reasoned explanation for why you want to do it, why you want to do that. And in the legislature's views, this was not qualitatively different than the legislature passing a host of other types of laws that apply to tech companies. You know, employment laws or, you know, financial, you know, all sorts of laws apply equally to tech companies as they do to others. So they they said, you know, what, what's the big deal here? We're acting within our police power. We're controlling conduct by companies that are doing business in our border. This is just not a speech case. The tech companies, of course, see it very differently, as does the Solicitor General. In their view, uh, this is something that regulates speech. In their view, the process of culling material, uh, curating material, analyzing what's appropriate to go up on the site is itself protected expressive activity. Therefore, it's entitled to First Amendment protection, and although possibly under some circumstances not present here, you could have a rationale why a legislature could regulate in that area. This kind of, you know, blunderbuss, broad-based approach taken by these two state legislatures was impermissible under the First Amendment. Uh, the court just granted review. Um, I mean, I, I tend to think they may, the court may be more inclined to limit what state legislatures can do. I think 
not only you know are, are the First Amendment concerns present, I think as a practical matter, it would make it you know very difficult, if not impossible, to kind of run or manage a social media site if, for example, every time you wanted to take down someone's post, you had to have some staff member like write a you know an opinion as to kind of why this post was coming down. I mean, you know, it doesn't take a lot of calculation to figure out that this would be a, a not infrequent occurrence. Um, and it would just make it very, very difficult as a practical matter, I think, to manage and operate these types of social media sites. Um, the court also granted review in a case involving um, whether a public official who excludes people from his or her social media uh, account is uh, in, in violating the First Amendment if it's their personal social media account. In other words, public official, personal account, they ban people. Are they acting as a state actor in that capacity when they limit people from accessing their site? Um, you know, here too, I, I think it's interesting and I think it poses a challenging line drawing problem for the court because although you could think, well, maybe one line to draw is, well, you know, do they use their personal account for kind of state affiliated business, in which case maybe there is kind of a First Amendment, you know, a concern at play. Whereas if their personal account is just for, you know, photos of their kids and their family vacations, well, then maybe they fall on the non state actor side of the line. Either way, this whole situation and the fact that they, the court seems to be busily adding all these social media cases to the docket reminds me of a, of a comment actually made by Justice Kagan uh, at an, in, when she was being interviewed at a law school a while ago where they asked her about the court's comfort level and kind of wading into the murky world of modern technology, you know, given that these justices, I'm, I'm speculating, may not be the most, you know, avant-garde, cutting-edge users and kind of the, the technological vanguard of society in the, in the way that you all and, you know, kind of the, the, the younger crowd is. And, and Justice Kagan paused and reflected and said something like, maybe we're not the best nine people to be deciding these issues on behalf of the United States. But nonetheless, when the Constitution is invoked, they do have a role to play. And I think it'll be very interesting just to see how they wade through this, uh, because these cases are not going away. I mean, the, the issue of public speech, the issue of social media, the issue of how closely these companies can be regulated is something that is getting a huge amount of attention, not just in state legislatures, but on Capitol Hill as well. Yeah, I see we're running a little past our time. I've got a, I've got a case that you're probably not going to read about in the paper that I'll try to summarize very quickly because I get to argue it in a month. Um, you know, this is a case called Rudisil. Uh, it involves um, veterans' benefits. Uh, basically, what happened is since, since the 80s, um, those who have served in the armed forces for three years, you get something called Montgomery, Montgomery benefits. These are modest stipends that you get every month. If you want to go to school for 36 months, uh, and you got to pay, you got to pay in 100 bucks a month to get this. So you know this was a, a fine program, a peacetime program. The United States wasn't involved in any wars. Then 9/11 happens. Obviously, war wartime service is much more arduous. So Congress, um, eventually, eight, seven, eight years later, decided we need to reward the, those who have been serving during wartime. So what they said is, for folks who have been getting who are entitled to Montgomery benefits, but they served after their qualified period of service after September 11th, you get these much more robust benefits. And basically, whereas Montgomery benefits are monthly stipends, um, uh, post 9/11 benefits are a free ride and stipends. It's way way more generous. And but now what happened is you had a bunch of people who had earned. Um, and already started using their Montgomery benefits that now had this, you know, op op had this ability to now you have the same period of service that happened after September 11, 2001 to uh, 20, 2009 when the effective date of the, of the post 9-11 GI Bill came into effect that, had, that they were suddenly eligible for much more generous benefits um, for the same period of service. So what Congress did is it created a, a regime that said if you want to uh, if you want to get rid of your Montgomery benefits and you want to get post 9-11 benefits instead, you make an election under this new provision, you get back your, your proportionate share of your Montgomery payments and you got a lot more benefits. So that's, that's, that's what the provision is dealing with. Now there are, however, a category of veterans that I think it's fair to say that Congress did not have in mind when it enacted this, that don't need to upgrade their benefits. That's because they have, they have served for so long that they have enough months to get Montgomery benefits, and then also enough additional months from a different period of service to get post 9-11 benefits, so they can have both sets of benefits. Now there is an overall 48-month cap, whatever. So what Congress, what, what the VA had interpreted is they had interpreted certain language 
in the in the in the provision that said that if you had you could trade your Montgomery benefits for post nine eleven benefits to say that even if you don't want to make that trade because you have a separate entitlement to post nine eleven benefits, you still have to uh, you still have to get into that regime. So essentially, what the VA has said is by accident, Congress has ended up screwing over multiple uh, uh, period of service veterans. There wasn't a circuit split on this issue, but it's exclusively within the province of the federal circuit. The federal circuit uh, incorrectly ruled and bank um, against uh, our client, who's a long, long serving a veteran. We took it to the U.S. Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court granted cert. Reply briefs due tomorrow. The case can be argued on November 8th. You know, I, I'm very happy to, to wear the clear white hat. Uh, in a case, I got an amicus brief. Um, from 41 states from California and Alabama supporting me, bipartisan congressional amicus brief, every veterans group, SG got nobody in support of her. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you know we ha I think we have the stronger of the textual arguments, but the, the statute is a mess. I think because Congress wasn't envisioning, wasn't thinking about this category of long serving veterans when it was creating this benefit conversion regime. So hopefully I will be able to um, secure a victory for these veterans. It's not, this case isn't gonna make a lot of the papers, but you're talking about a regime that impacts 1.7 um, million veterans and growing as more continue to serve, and it could be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars to any particular veteran. You get into billions of dollars. So it's actually, in dollars and cents, it's one of the most important cases this term, and you know, be excited to argue it. Awesome. Well, good luck with that. And um, I guess in our remaining time, uh, I'm happy to answer questions, comments, questions, thoughts from the group on the Supreme Court term or life in general. Especially about us, I know I was super excited for you guys. <laughs> yes. So I was wondering if you could speak briefly about one of my favorite cases from this term that's being argued today, uh, the yes. Great Lakes case. Oh, I was going to talk about the other one that's being argued today. <laughs> <laughs> well, that means you do Great Lakes. I'm not, so, I, I can't. So, uh, well, I was gonna say, what's the, the, the uh, is? Uh, the enforceability of a choice of law clause oh in, an ab in a maritime contract. <laughs> 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 Tom, this is the nightmare, right? You, you study, you know, you, don't, you have a study for the exam. <laughs> no, I think, I think the way that we'll, we'll, we'll kind of, you know, give a lesson in appellate advocacy. You acknowledge the question. That's a brilliant, great, great question. Very important case. Very interesting to see what the Supreme Court will do with it. Another case that argues. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll get back to it. I'd be happy to submit some little paper on this, Your Honor. <laughs> Choice of law and maritime. That's that's awesome. I mean, when is contrary to the strong public policy of of the state? Oh my God, it's awesomely esoteric. So so let me let me let me let me, let me address the other case being argued this morning. So the other case being argued this morning is actually significant because it, it was being argued by uh, my law partner Gene Scalia, who's a graduate of this university. Uh, Gene Scalia, as you may know, is not just a Gibson Dunn partner, former Secretary of Labor, uh, former Solicitor of Labor too, um, and he was the actual person who, when I was a law student, recruited me for the firm. This is his first argument in the Supreme Court because when his father served on the court, he couldn't argue. Um, so this is his first argument. His father. Uh, had one argument, too, before the Supreme Court. Uh, so now he will equal his father in Supreme Court arguments. He just argued it this morning. Um, I, I've been kind of anxiously searching for news reports. I haven't seen how he did, uh, but it's a case involving uh, the whistleblower provisions um, in, in federal law about whether uh, a, a plaintiff tried to uh, sue for being fired or, or you know, discharged or demoted because he was a whistleblower has to prove retaliatory intent on the part of the employer. Again, I don't know how it went. Uh, I can say that you know we, we mooted Gene, and I mean he's, he's he's got a lot of promise. Don't get me wrong. I mean you know <laughs> seemed seemed to do well, seemed to have control of the cases. So so we'll see, we'll see. Um, but th there, I, I trust that you know the, the press will cover that you know with at least equal vigor as as the Maritime, which is awesome. Okay, other other questions. Yeah. So on the veteran on the veterans benefits case. I was wondering yes. if you could, uh, just about you know the, the role that, that you see the veterans benefits canon playing in this, you know the sort of uh, substantive canon that says we construe statutes to favor you know veterans benefits, and also sort sort of more broadly what you think about these substantive canons and how they mesh with textualism in the originals project. Yeah. So um, the, the the pro veterans canon is just what you would think, which is that if you have a statute, it's like the opposite of Chevron. If you have this, if you have the a statute that's unclear with regard to veterans, the tie goes to the veteran. Essentially, any ambiguity needs to be resolved in favor of the veteran. And this canon goes back 150 years. We have, you know, we have 
s multiple really good amicus briefs from veteran or veterans organizations talking about how venerable his canon is, and the point that they make, and that I'm happy to embrace, is that when you have a candidate that's this long standing, it kind of becomes part of what Congress is doing when it's drafting statutes. So when Congress is, for example, here, creating a regime that is supposed to be this really generous benefit exchange rate, um, provision for those who need it, if, it if, it, if that handiwork could accidentally be read to also screw over this entirely different group of long-serving veterans, unless it's unambiguous that that's what the provision does, you know, that you're not going to read Congress to have accidentally screwed over a bunch of veterans. And this is, um, you know, and, and since this canon is so long standing, I think it's fair to argue that the Congress drafts its veterans benefits statutes with the understanding of this canon. If you, you know, it's one thing if you're coming up with a new law for a new country, you know, do you want to have these canons? Maybe, maybe not. But once you have canons that are embedded in what Congress is doing. You can't really lose the with a football and pull it out from them and change what the statute means, which was informed by the canon when Congress drafted when Congress drafted the relevant statute. Great. Yeah. Hello, Chevron Blackburn, please. Why do you think it was Yeah, that, that's a great question, and uh, I mean, you know, I, I say I, I think it's likelier that they will overrule Chevron rather than narrow it, but I, I, I mean, honestly, I can't say that with like you know a huge degree of confidence because, as I said, you know, year after year, we keep thinking this is the case where they're actually going to overrule it and won't. Um, I, I guess I tend to think that the the easier path is overruling it simply because. I, I worry if they let Chevron survive in some diminished form. I mean, it, it almost seems like gamesmanship. In other words, that, well, we're, we're not going to overrule Chevron because we're just going to redefine Chevron in a way that makes it not Chevron anymore. I mean, you know, kind of, it's, 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 a, little, it's a little cute. Um, you know, I don't think that overruling Chevron, my sense is it will not, you know, spark the, the you know, national furor and outcry that the court got when it overruled, you know, other notable decisions in the last few years. I think that there is a sense kind of among, you know, people of, you know, all political bents that Chevron kind of stands on shaky foundations and always has. And again, while I, I certainly cannot rule out the possibility that it will live to fight another day, I tend to think the easier solution, the easier course here, certainly the doctrinally clearer course, would simply be to overrule it and just say, you know, no deference or, or give it whatever deference, you know, you think it's worth. I mean, if you want to, you know, if you find the agency's rationale and interpretation persuasive, obviously you can adopt it, but you're not required to ascribe kind of, you know, a little, you know, weight on the scales and give it significance. They could say that, but again, to me it seems if they're just going to allow Chevron to survive as a shell of its former self, it might be doctrinally cleaner just to overrule it and start afresh. So, it's a good question. Okay. Oh, sorry, one more? Yeah. Yeah. So, in the lower court net choice of opinions, there wasn't a lot of exploration on the racial public meaning of the speech clause, how it was. I believe Judge Logan had one little section in his opinion. I don't think Judge Lucinda really talks about it at all. Do you think the Supreme Court will ever try to engage in a more exhaustive originalist analysis of the speech clause to see how it applies to social media platforms? That's a great question, too. Do you want, I, I, I've got some thoughts, but you no, want to tackle it? No, no, no. So I, 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 I kind of almost think that they should. I mean, it, it's, it's interesting in that you see the way the court has approached you know, you know, other amendments, say the Second Amendment, and, and they, the, the, the kind of the conventional wisdom now, the way that the court approaches it, basically does you know, deep historical dives. You know, look at the original meaning, look at the practice, the traditions of the nation at the time of the founding. Um, but to your point, I mean, they, they typically don't engage in that when it comes to you know, free speech, free expression. Um, that said, I think that there is, is a lot of ferment in that area of law, uh, both in just kind of, you know, the, the you know, legal approach you take to determining what is protected by the amendment, but also just in the area of First Amendment generally. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, kind of, you know, New York Times versus Sullivan, and a lot of these kind of, you know, really enshrined First Amendment precedents that, you know, like them or not, I understand the originalist argument that these were kind of, you know, manufactured out of whole cloth. And, and so I tend to think that, yes, at some point they, they, they will do that and take that approach. To me, at least, it seems you know, kind of jurisprudentially consistent with the way that they have approached other questions of, of the historical meanings of amendments. Whether this is the case in which they do it, you know, hard to say. But, but I do sense that there is at least some support on the court for a reevaluation of how they approach First Amendment questions kind of ab initio. Yeah. yeah. So. 
Well, thank you guys so much for coming, and please join me in thanking our speakers.